First Wesleyan Church, so great to see each of you here this morning, whether you're joining us here in person or online. Welcome. Let's stand together and glorify our God's name. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives. And I will walk with you, knowing you'll see me through, and sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I can sing in the troubled times, sing when I win. I can sing when I lose my step and fall down again. I can sing because you pick me up, sing because you're there. I can sing because you hear me, Lord, when I call to you in prayer. I can sing with my last breath, sing, for I know that I'll sing with the angels, saints around the throne. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I know I am loved by the King. And it makes my heart want to sing. Amen. May you know that you are loved by the King. Thanks for joining us here. You may be seated. Well, good morning to each of you. I'm glad you're here at First Wesleyan Church this morning. I hope each of you got a bulletin on your way in. If you didn't happen to grab one, you can feel free to go out to the high top tables out in the commons area, and there is a bulletin there for you. There's a couple of announcements I'm going to run through, but I'm not going to run through all of them. But the first one is if you could take out an attendance record and fill out the requested information and then place that in the offering plate on your way out, that would be a great thing. If you're a first-time guest, thanks for being a first-time guest. 
Stop at the Commons area with your attendance record. We have a special gift just for you. And if you're viewing online, 605-430-3019, just text me and let me know you're watching as well. Many of you have a baby bottle from Black Hills Pregnancy Center. Those are due today. If you didn't happen to bring yours, bring it in sometime this week. The office is closed tomorrow, so don't bring it tomorrow, but bring it in sometime this week. I do want you to know that we have received some money, and I've carried some money in already, and it was kind of kind of heavy with all the change uh, with the bo- baby bottles, but we've received $1,234.59 that we have already turned in, so thank you for giving. Yes, that's, a one, that's great. Thank you. It's one of those things that maybe you don't understand the impact that you have, but for somebody who goes into Black Hills Pregnancy Center who is in a difficult situation and they're not sure what to do and they can receive some help for life, we think that's a wonderful thing. So thank you for being a part of the baby bottle campaign for the month of May here. If you are planning to go to youth camp or you have a child that's planning to go to youth camp, the registrations are due on June 1, and so please make sure you sign up. There is a way to sign up. It's in the bulletin. Please take a look at that. We are needing some people to help out with the fellowship time, which that means help getting uh, snacks ready in between services, as well as we need some people at the information desk. If you're one of those that would be willing, you're not serving anywhere, uh, and you'd like to come a little early on some Sundays and help with setting up coffee and with the donut holes, or if you'd like to help greet people at the information desk, please mark I or F on your attendance record and somebody will be in touch with you. If you're planning on helping with Vacation Bible School, which is just right around the corner, we have a meeting at 7 p.m. this Wednesday night. Now, if you don't know who's directing that, hey, Boris and Tabitha are right over here. Just wave at us, Boris and Tabitha. They are directing it. And so if you're like, what's happening at Vacation Bible School? I've been wanting to do that, but I didn't know if I could, you know, uh, well, um, get along with the leaders. You can get along with these two. Uh, and if you can't get along with Boris, you'll get along with Tabitha for sure. Uh, no, I'm wonderful. Thank you for leading. And it'll be wonderful. But if you want to help out, Uh, please come to the meeting, and if you have any questions, please see Boris and Tabitha. As well as, if you have a child or you know of someone, please register for for Vacation Bible School. You can do that at rcfirst.org slash vbs. There's other announcements that are in the bulletin. You'll want to take a look at those. But now I'm going to turn it back over to the praise team as they lead us in worship through singing this morning. Thanks for being here this morning. As some of you know, throughout our sermon series, Deuteronomy, one of the common themes that we've continued to uh, come back on is to remember that we were once slaves. Moses continues to encourage God's people to remember that they were once slaves. And so this morning, uh, to go along with that theme, I'd like us to sing the good old hymn, Amazing Grace to thank God for His saving grace. The line says, I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. It's a transformation, right? It's God's transforming power at work. And with that, today is Pentecost Sunday, a Sunday in the church calendar where we reflect and we celebrate and we yearn for that same transformative power of God that came upon His people through the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Let's just read that Scripture reference together. It'll be on the screen behind me. Let's read this aloud. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What an incredible sight of God's transforming power coming upon, literally coming upon His people. But the thing is, not everyone saw it as that. Some scoffed. Some people even called them drunk. But Peter declares in verse 17, in the last days it will be, God declares, 
that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And later Peter says, Pentecost, later P- Peter says, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, Pentecost is a fulfillment of God's prophecy in the Old Testament. And Peter wanted to make sure everyone knew this. And so to remember and reflect on this powerful, transforming act of God, we're going to sing the first verse of Amazing Grace in another language. Some of you have already done that. In Mizo, a language that is uh, popular to the Myanmar community. And the words will be on the screen. I want to encourage you to worship in this way. The phonetic lyric lines will be in the font color of white. And then from there, we're going to cry out to our God to consume us from the inside out, to take control of our lives with the same power of the Holy Spirit that swept through on the day of Pentecost, coming coming upon the people of God, And then we're going to welcome His transforming power and His presence in this space, in our families, in our church, in our souls. May the cry of our hearts this morning to be, come, Holy Spirit, come. So I invite you, let's stand together, let's continue to worship our God. Koni. Nama moele tu suaria vai tang dam na swala pu minzu da mi tell. Let's sing that again. Koni nama moele tu suavia vai tang tam na swala. Let's sing Twas Grace. Twas Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already. thus far and grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Koni nama moele tu 
สวรยาไฟทองดำนาสวาลาปูมิน z o o m u d a มิเทลมิดวานาชูเท่าสิ่งที่ฉันทำผิดยังมีความเมตตาอยู่ตลอดไปถ้าฉันเดินผิดอีกครั้งฉันถูกจำกัดจากคุณพระคุณทรงเป็นเสียงสันติสุขทุกสิ่งจะแสดงออกมาเมื่อทุกอย่างสิ้นไปทุกสิ่งจะแสดงออกมาเมื่อทุกอย่างสิ้นไปทุกสิ่งจะแสดงออกมา My heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out. Will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out. Our heart and our soul, Lord, we give you control. Consume us from the inside out, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by Your presence, Lord. Your presence. 
presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord holy spirit you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord holy spirit you are welcome Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Psalm 126, verse 3 says this. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. This day represents the coming of the Holy Spirit. He's done a great work in each of our lives. He has brought gladness to us. So let us go to the Lord 
in prayer. The altars are open to anyone that would like to come up during this time. But will you bow your heads with me? Will you bow your hearts with me as we humbly go before our God? Almighty God, it is your presence that we long for. It is your presence that we need moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. God, we look to you and we ask for more. We ask for more of you, Lord, and you have done great things in our lives. We have times in our lives where we can't see your plan unfold, but we experience the goodness of your presence through it. And there's times in our life where we have the privilege of seeing your plan unfold, and we still have the same joy. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the sending of the Holy Spirit, fulfilling your scripture, the promise. God, you said that you would take our heart of stone and give us a new heart of flesh, that you would put your Holy Spirit within us and cause us to obey your commandments and statutes. God, we praise you that you want to be and dwell with us that your Holy Spirit lives within us now and that everybody that has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ has received it. It's available to all. And so God, we praise you for the great work you've done in each of our lives. We praise you for the work of Jesus who came, who lived, who died and rose again and then rose up victoriously to you, O oh God, and sits at your right hand we praise you for his work. And because of that, God, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our willful transgressions, our outbursts of anger, our lack of self-control at times. God, we know that your word says if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So right now where our plea is Jesus' name. So Lord, forgive us. And God, we're thankful for the Black Hills Pregnancy Center and all the work they do to serve our community, to help mothers, to help the lives of the unborn, to put a stop to abortion. God, we're thankful for them. And I pray as they finish out their, their baby bottle campaign that you would provide greatly for them, that you would continue to minister to moms and families and children in a mighty and powerful way through them. Thank you for the Black Hills Pregnancy Center. And Lord, we lift up Richland Wesleyan Church in Minas, South Dakota. And I think of Pastor Jason Dignan. Thank you for Pastor Jason. Thank you for his heart to serve you. I pray that you would protect him, that your Holy Spirit would guide him and his family, and that he would direct the church to be the best possible witness for your glory and your glory alone. Thank you for Richland Wesleyan Church. Thank you for Pastor Jason. And Lord, today, well, tomorrow, Lord, but this weekend is Memorial Weekend where we remember the sacrifice of those who served and gave their life so that we can have freedom now, that we can have freedom to be right now in this moment praying out loud, worshiping together. We didn't come in today, Lord, wondering if people are gonna be bursting through the doors. God, thank you for the freedom that you've allowed us to have. And God, I ask that you be with the families that have lost loved ones in service, that you would provide for them and protect them. And I pray for the families right now that have made the sacrifice to 
Stay behind as their loved one goes out to serve. Be with them. Protect them. Remind them that you are with them. And Lord, now I pray for anybody that's in the sound of my voice that came in with a burden, maybe some confusion, some questioning, maybe is still grieving over the loss of a loved one. Holy Spirit, you are our comforter. And I ask that you would come upon them right now and remind them that you are with them and comfort them in the way that you know they need to be comforted. Only you can do what you can do. Father, I pray for those that came in with exceeding joy. What a wonderful thing that is. The great things that they are reminded of, of you, what you've done in their life. I pray it be contagious to those around them and who they come in contact with. God, as we continue in worship, be with Pastor Steve. Holy Spirit, give him the words to say and give us ears to hear and a heart to receive what your instruction is, what your encouragement is. God, help us to become more like Jesus through worshiping you today. I pray all these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles today, I encourage you to open them to Deuteronomy chapter 25. If uh, you're a guest of ours, you don't know that we're in the midst of Deuteronomy, but if you're a regular attender, you know we're in the midst of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 25. If you didn't happen to bring a Bible, there's one in a chair rack near you, and it's on page 166, and then even on page 167. As has been mentioned already, happy Memorial Day weekend to all of you. It began in the 1800s, and the founder was General John Logan. Does anybody know what the uh, name of the Memorial Day was before it was Memorial Day? Anybody know? Decoration Day. I think maybe somebody said it over here. It was called Decoration Day, and now it's called Memorial Day. And I am just thankful for those who have paid the the price uh, for the freedoms that we enjoy. As was mentioned in the prayer time, we didn't have somebody standing out front with a gun. We didn't have somebody standing out front with a camera saying, oh, look who's coming in. You didn't have to sneak in unless you were a little bit late, and then you had to kind of sneak in the sanctuary. But you didn't have to sneak in and wonder, okay, is anybody going to know that I am here and I'm thankful for the freedoms that we have? And one of those is the freedom to worship. And uh, maybe you've been to the cemetery, maybe you haven't, maybe that's a tradition for yours, for you and yours, uh, of putting flowers on the grave, but uh, we're just thankful for those who have uh, given us the freedoms that we have. Since 1971, it's been honored on the last Monday in May, so anybody have to work tomorrow? One, two, well, everybody else gets it off, but you two, thank you for working, uh, Memorial Day. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Memorial Day. Um, the title of the message today is Helps for Today. I was meeting with some men yesterday, and they're like, well, is that for yesterday and for tomorrow? It is. So it it's helps for yesterday as well as tomorrow, but meaning the time period in which we live and we turn to God's Word. One has said this about this Deuteronomy passage, the whole thrust of this section is that holy faith must issue in holy action. The effect of sanctification of souls is the sanctification of society. We need to become holy as individuals, and then we can be a holy group of people. Attention now turns to situations in which individuals are largely or wholly at the mercy of of others. It has been said that the treatment of the helpless is the touchstone of our civilization. And so as we look at Deuteronomy chapter 25 today, please think about how should we treat others, and that's with fairness. If you join me in God's Word, I'm going to read all of the chapter, chapter 25. If there is a dispute between men and they come into court and the judges decide between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. And then if the guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with a number of stripes in proportion to his offense. 
Forty stripes may be given him, but no, not more, lest if one should go on to beat him with more stripes than these, your brother be degraded in your sight. You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel." And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate and elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to any man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. Kind of a funny name. Verse 11, And when men fight with one another, and the wife of the one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of him who was beating him, and puts out her hand and seizes him by the private parts, then you shall cut off her hand. Your eye shall have no pity." You shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, a large and a small. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and fair weight you shall have, a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are an abomination to the Lord your God. Remember what Amalek did to you. On the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance possessed, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Number one, the guilty is charged. Disputes happen. I wonder if you've ever been involved in a dispute of some kind. I hope it wasn't on the way to church this morning, though it is kind of interesting how the enemy tries to uh, break some of those things up even when we're coming to church, maybe in a family, maybe in, in, as you're a couple, maybe something on the, on the radio you're frustrated with. But if you've been involved in a dispute, you know there can be very great difficulties, maybe with your brother maybe with your sister, maybe a family member, maybe a classmate. Let me stop for just a moment and say, if you have a dispute with a family member, settle that now. The days go by really quickly at times, and we have disputes, and so I encourage you to settle that. But disputes happen, and they can confuse, and they can challenge, and they can frustrate. And we all have our opinion on the disputes, trust me in that. And we try to get people on our side and help defend us. A dispute happened recently on a subway in New York involving a man by the name of Daniel Penny and involving a man by the name of Jordan Neely. If you've watched your screens at all recently, you know that now a a jury will probably soon determine Penny's fate and what happens with him. This trial was going to lead to the acquitting and the condemning of two people, and stripes were to be given. However, there was a limit. I, I'm unsure how they got to 40, but I do know that anything more than 40 was not right. Some of that would be, man, some could just get angry and just go at it for a number of times and say, no, you got to stop. Some of you have understood that. <laughs> You've understand somebody being angry at you and just, mm, just going crazy. I, I, I won't look for a show of hands here, but I wonder if you've ever had stripes. Now, what were stripes? They were actually the whips on a back. That's what the stripes were. Now, um, most of us in 2023 are far removed from this, but it still happens today. Maybe uh, you're one that's like, oh, I received stripes, but they weren't quite on my back. They were a little lower, and uh, it was out of the woodshed. Now, um, we won't talk about that a whole lot today, but um, if... um, Is this scripture saying that we should still give stripes? Am I giving any parents uh, legality today to go home and if uh, your children are misbehaving to say, 
Well, 40 stripes. No, I'm not saying that by any means. Uh, and there has to be some semblance. But not all offenders were given 40 stripes. Maybe when you were reading this, maybe not. But maybe when you were reading this, you immediately jumped to the New Testament. And you thought of two people, uh, specifically, that were given stripes. One of those being Jesus. He was a righteous man, and he did nothing wrong, though he was flogged. Now, you may say there's something different between flogging and striping. We believe there were lashes. We're unsure how many he received because he was tried under Roman law. This was Jewish law. But he was receiving, he received stripes, Jesus did. He received lashes. As I was preparing this message, I called up online the scene from The Passion of the Christ. Maybe you've seen that movie, maybe you haven't, of where Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, where he was stripped and he was flogged. And if you remember that scene at all, it's quite... uh, quite uh, grotesque, actually, of, of the stripes that he took and the pain that he bore. But the Scripture says, by his wounds, we are healed. And I'm very thankful for that. One thing I know about this, the stripes weren't just kind slaps that a boy on the back, on the back or on the shoulder, but they were very painful And this could be decided upon. The other one that um, might come to your mind is Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, Paul says this about himself, about himself. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. (laughs) Think on that. I mean, I, 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 I can't, maybe you can because maybe you, you've experienced it, and if you have, I'm, I'm sorry about that, that you've been beat unmercifully. Uh, unmercifully. I'm sorry about that, uh, and, and that was not good. But, I, but most of us can't even comprehend this. We can't even understand being striped 40 times on our back with somebody who's not real happy with us. Paul had it five times. I'm going to leave the Bible to speak for itself on discipline. However, I do know that we need discipline for our children. We don't need to give our children 40 stripes. So if you're a dad or a mom, uh, don't say that and go there at all. Verse 1 says, if there's a dispute between men, God disciplines us and we need discipline for adults or things would just run amok. There has to be guidelines for what we do or we don't do. And so justice was to be done for disputes. The second thing from this passage is instructions for livestock, or maybe it wasn't just for livestock. It seems that th- this is just kind of interesting. I mean, here you have uh, three verses talking about stripes and disputes between men and coming to court, and then you shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. What's this talking about? Well, if an ox was treading the grain, it is thought that the ox should be able to eat while he is doing his work. Now, maybe you know what treading is. Maybe you don't know what treading is. But I was able to go a number of years ago to Washington, D.C. And on our trip to Washington, D.C., we went to Mount Vernon. Has anybody ever been to Mount Vernon? Been to Mount Vernon? Okay. Several of you have. And if you were able to... Not Mount Vernon, South Dakota. Come on now, man. Yeah. Have you been to Mount Vernon... Okay, um, Megan is from, Mount, I thought that's what you're saying, is I'm from Mount Vernon. Yeah, anybody been to Mount Vernon, South Dakota? I mean, the big metropolis, there we go. Um, yes, uh, Mount Vernon, uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, was where George Washington lived, and they had a treading barn. And so I have a picture of the treading barn that's going to be shown behind me. This isn't actually an ox, it's actually a horse, but what they would do is they'd bring the harvest in, And then the horse would run on the harvest, and then what it would do is it tread out the grain. And so if you see the next picture behind me, you will see that the grain is coming through the slats that were in the wood, and so the grain would come through. Now, what is happening is that they would say, you shouldn't put a muzzle. Now, what's a muzzle? Now, some of you as young men or young ladies we're probably mentioning this about with your parents. We're like, 
they didn't say put a muzzle on you, but they're like, hey, we need to put something on you because, you know, there's, there, you're talking way too much. So basically what would happen is they'd put a muzzle on the ox so that they couldn't eat while they were working. It's like, you get to work. We're not going to feed you anything. You, you, you just keep going. But what it's being said here is it's okay to feed the ox while they're treading out the grain. While they're working, it's okay to feed them. One of the neat things about this is it shows God's heart for creatures. Of all the things talked about in the law, here's one for animals. And saying, hey, treat your animals okay. And they can eat while they work. It's interesting. Many of you have read through the New Testament. But if you haven't read through the New Testament, um, you might know that this verse is mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament. And so what does this verse mean and what is it? Tell us in the New Testament. Well, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says it right here. Paul says it, Paul says it this way. For it is written in the law of the Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Or he mentions it also in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. For the Scripture says... You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So here it is in the Old Testament talking about ox. But in the New Testament, Paul changes a little. He doesn't change it, but he just adds to it. And he says, what is being said here? Actually, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, it says, In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And so what is being said here? It's being said that the laborer deserves food for his, he's worthy of his wages. In Luke chapter 10, verse 7, it says this way, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. So the Old Testament is saying, hey, if your ox is working, then your ox can get food as well as while he's working. But then he's saying in the New Testament, hey, those who are working around you in ministry, feed them. And so you may say, what are my offerings going to? I'm going to talk next week from Deuteronomy chapter 26 on bringing in first fruits and talking about tithes. What is, my, what is my money going for? It's going to pay for people who minister to you. And so that is what Scripture is talking about. It kind of goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, which I talked on last week from verses 14 and 15 and saying, you shouldn't oppress a hired worker. You should give them his wages on the same day. So be kind to those who are working among you. The third thing is this. The bloodline should be kept going. I was chatting with someone recently and uh, sharing with that person that I know two families where brothers married sisters. Now that doesn't happen a whole lot, and maybe you know of some, but I know too that brothers have married sisters. I also know a family where a brother and a sister married a brother and a sister. They didn't marry brothers and brothers and brothers didn't marry, and sister and sister didn't marry, but brothers, the brother married the sister, and the other brother married the other sister, and so they went kind of crossways. It's, there's a gr great family connection for the Israelites. If one brother was to die, then his brother was to take up the role and marry inside the family. If the brother was unwilling to do so, then someone else had to be found. Last week, we talked about Ruth and Boaz a little bit. And we talked about Ruth going and picking up in the fields from chapter 24. Again, here again, it talks about Ruth and Boaz. If you go um, to um, the book of Ruth, you don't have to, but if you do go to the book of Ruth and you see uh, in uh, Boaz's case, he's wanting to take Ruth on as his wife, but there was somebody who was closer that he had to 
uh, be able to um, get, uh, he had to be able to get to Ruth through these, this exchanging of this sandal thing. Here's what it says in Ruth chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Now, you may be saying, what is it with shoes? What is it with sandals? Now, especially here in South Dakota, what happens when you go to somebody's house? You typically, not all the time, but you typically take off your shoes when you go in because you don't want to mess up whatever. You say, okay. Now, it doesn't happen in everybody's house, but a lot of times that happens. What happens with our shoes? At the end of the day, when we get home, we take off our shoes. Why? We let down a little bit. We resign to rest. And so what's happening is offering the sandals say, I resign to you, my brother. I don't think many of you sleep with your shoes on, do you? I mean, I don't sleep with my shoes on. I don't actually sleep with socks on either. Um, some of you do. I'm not sure why you do that, but that's okay. That's another topic that has nothing to do with Scripture. It's just my editorial comment. But a shoe was a sign of one's power and right. We, we don't totally understand this in our culture, but the keeping of the bloodline was very important. There was a fear that extinction for a family line would happen. Maybe this happened because the thought of being childless was a mark on the family as well. Now, this wasn't absolutely mandated. However, it was expected and hoped for. And so I want you to understand that God is concerned for your heritage. I'm not sure where you've been. Some of you have come from messy families. I was talking to someone. Uh, uh, it was even yesterday. I was talking to someone and this person said, where she came from is just amazing because that family is a mess. And maybe you came from that. But God can redeem those things. And even if your family is messy now, please know this, God can redeem those parts of your family. He was concerned for families. The fourth thing I want you to talk about is this, careful touching. So uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of great detail about 11 to 12, as it should probably be left discreet, and it's in the Scripture, and you understand it. I will say this, though. The ESV says private parts. And I will say this. There are some things that should be covered and should be private. We are in a culture and a society, society that says, bear it all. And I say, no, there needs to be modesty. Now, some might agree or disagree with me on how much should be shown and what we should or should not look at, but clearly there are things that should be private. And so I encourage you, as we approach this coming summer season, let's approach our lives with modesty instead of with showing. There are some things that we should keep private and we should be concerned about. Now, you may say that this is just talking about touching, so let me say this, be careful with your touches. We need to be careful on how we touch people. This lady that was involved in verses 11 and 12 was going to lose her hand. <laughs> wow. What if, happened, what if that was in our society? You touch somebody inappropriately, you lose a hand. We might have a lot of uh, handless people in our society. Maybe you've been touched incorrectly by somebody. Um, Maybe, as Scripture said, in a place that it shouldn't have been touched. I apologize for that, and I ask that you would forgive that person and that you would move on. Um, I help with four- and five-year-olds on Wednesday nights uh, during their school year, and we have this little song that we sing. Uh, we sing, crisscross applesauce, hands in your lap. Why do we sing that little song with four- and five-year-olds? Well, I've worked with some of your four- and five-year-olds, and some of their hands just like to flail all over. Why? I don't know. Just, you just got to move your hands for some reason. And so we say, crisscross applesauce hands in your lap so they're not flailing all over. Some of those hands just hit people, and I'm not sure why. 
But if little boys and girls keep their hand to themselves, we need to abide by these as well. And then let me say this on further. Let's keep conversation about private parts private. We have allowed in our culture and even on our screens private things that shouldn't be. And so let me encourage you, keep those screens turned off to that. Don't allow that in your home. And keep conversation about private things private. Sometimes we're in places where we just kind of laugh about that. Don't do that. Say, let's stop. Be careful with your touches, and I encourage you in this way, let Jesus touch your soul. Number five, having fair weights. Be fair. So, verses 13 to 16 is telling us to be fair. It's important for us to live rightly. Now, we don't do much with weights now, but they did things to weigh out. But they are being told to be honest and to not cheat others. See, one could use, could use a heavy weight for buying and then a small weight for selling. And unless you really know, you, you wouldn't know. He's like, oh, well, that's the weight they're being used. And that, no, he's saying be honest. As one has said, shaded honesty is dishonesty. And then perfect honesty is rewarded and dishonesty is condemned. We want fairness. We want to not be cheated. Dwight D. Eisenhower writes this. In order to be a leader, or maybe he said this, it's written anyway, quoted by him. In order to be a leader, a man must have followers. And to have followers, a man must have their confidence. Hence, the supreme quality for a leader is unquestionably integrity. Without it, no real success is possible. No matter, no whether, no matter whether it's on a section gain, a football field, in an army, or in an office. If a man's associates find him guilty of phoniness, if they find he lacks forthright integrity, he will fail. His teachings and actions must square with each other. The first great need, therefore, is integrity and high purpose. Moses is telling the Israelites, be fair with your weights. We should be fair and honest as well. Um, we should be full of integrity. In all your business dealings, be fair. And then let me mention this. God is fair with each of us. I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> he, he is not unfair with you whatsoever. The sixth thing from the passage is this. Remembering Amalek. Amalek were the descendants, the Amalekites, were the descendants of Esau. Now, what they had done is they had attacked Israel's rear flanks in the Sinai Desert. And because they attacked Israel, they were attacking God. Please hear me in this. When others attack you, you may feel that great attack in some which way. But please know, people aren't just attacking you, they're attacking God at the same time. And so when you feel like you're being threatened, please know that God is on your side as well. Please know this also, that God has your back and that He goes before you and He helps you. But here's what happens in the Scripture, and I hope you hear this. Verse 17, it says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way that you came out of Egypt. They were to remember and they were to destroy Amalek. However, they didn't do this. They forgot. And then God commands Saul through Samuel to take care of this. You'll see this in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And then, did Saul do this? He did not. He did not fully distract and destroy the Amalekites, which then disabled him from the kingship. So what is being said here? He's saying, remember, destroy them. They didn't. 
And because of that, the Amalekites continued to come against them. The scriptural lesson is this. Obey the Lord when he tells you to remember and defeat. What does that mean? It means this. It says, you were brought out of Egypt, and the Amalekites were still trying to get you down. And because you didn't destroy them, then they continued to come. And he says, destroy them completely. Many of you have been brought out of Egypt. What does that mean? It means that you have been saved. It means that you have been set free. But there may be something in your life that needs to be completely destroyed. Destroy it now with God's power or that will continue to come. God gives you the encouragement to do that. How do we know this is true? Again, I will go to Colossians chapter 3, and here's what it says in Colossians chapter 3. I'm not going to read all of 3, but here's what it says, verse 1. If, you, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, and then down to verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And it goes on and on. He says it in this way. Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. He says it in this way. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I end the message in this way. Our enemy continues to defeat and to destroy us. Even when we've left Egypt, even that life of slavery, the Israelites had left Egypt and the Amalekites came on them. God wanted them destroyed in the same way the enemy tries to cut you off at the tail and at the head. Whatever it is, and we need to rely on the Lord for His redeeming power. I want to point you to Galatians chapter, I think it's Galatians chapter Chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't allow the enemy to come in, but destroy the enemy completely. Settle disputes quickly and well. Take care of your workers. Honor your bloodline. Be careful of your touches. Be fair and honest in your dealings. And ask God to destroy and allow God to destroy all that evil that might be trying to come against you. Would you stand with me today? I want to pray for each of you. God, I thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us these moments to come and center around your word. I thank you for these people who have said, yes, I want to come and I want to worship in spirit and in truth and I want to hear from God's word. I pray that each would go from the sanctuary today with your encouragement and with your instruction on each of their lives. I pray, God, that we would be very careful in how we deal with people, how we would be fair with others, how we would be fair with the, the guilty and fair with, with those weights and measures. May we be full of integrity and, and honesty. And God, I just pray that you would be with each of us, that we would destroy those things with your power that want to destroy us. And I pray that we would be raised with Christ and we would put to death, but then you would help us to put on all of these things. Thank you that we've been washed. Thank you that we've been sanctified. Thank you that we've been justified by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. And I pray that you would help us. If there's somebody here this morning who's not been uh, redeemed from this bondage of Egypt, the bondage of sin, I pray that even right now they would say yes to you and they would turn to you, O oh, righteous Father. And then God, if there's somebody here who's been battling with something and and the Amalekites or whatever, the enemy's been coming in, I pray that they would remember that you are the one that can destroy all. And so help them. Help me. Help us all here. And may we stand strong against the enemy and his treatment of us. Oh God, I pray that you would be with each person, that they would be lifted up by your might and your power. And all this week, 
May we glorify your name. May you protect us. May you guide us. May you encourage us. And may you give us of your strength. We love you, Heavenly Father. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.